So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, if you're coming to us from New Zealand, a few of you are. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm very, very warm thanks to Jill Hadfield for joining us again. We're very happy to have her back once more, uh, giving us even more ideas about teaching online. So without further ado, Jill, thank you very much. Hello. Um, kia ora from New Zealand, and I'd just like to say I'm very delighted to be doing something for JALT again. I've been to some very happy conferences in Japan and um, enjoyed meeting a lot of the teachers there. Okay, um, today I'll be talking about constraints and creativity in online classes. Um, and a lot of the activities, well, all the activities come from a book I recently did with Lindsay um, called Live Online Teaching. Um, the title looks a bit to me like live online teaching, but um, that's, that, that's uh, perhaps what everybody's doing at the moment. Um, so um, we called it constraints and creativity because um, it seemed to us that, um, that having to teach online in a way um, imposes constraints. The normal constraints, um, normal constraints have been classrooms with no technology that's felt as um, a big constraint on people's teaching. Um, what do you do if you have no photocopier? What do you do if your classroom has no books, for example? What do you do if the children don't have exercise books but only slates? How do you teach like that? But in a way, um, another... Sorry, I've just lost the cursor. Technology without classrooms is what we're having to cope with in modern times. And this is just as much a constraint in a way as um, teaching without technology at all. So um, I just like to first of all consider the apparently paradoxical link between constraints and creativity. So um, first of all, in Grammars of Creation, George Steiner defines creativity as that which is enacted freedom. Um, most writers on creativity see creativity as breaking boundaries. Um, it's like creativity is complete freedom, going against the rules, breaking the boundaries. I mean, that sort of well-worn um, corporate um, cliche, thinking outside the box. Um, however, other writers stress the paradoxical need of creativity for constraints. Um, a theme that appears to characterize all creative processes is the challenge of balancing various constraints in a constructive way. Um, and they're not the only ones uh, who've talked about creativity and constraints. Um, Stokes goes even further, finding constraints actually promote creativity. The more constrained the problem solve, the solution paths, the more variable, the more creative the problem solvers. And I really like this um, uh, quote from an interview with an artist. Um, he says, constraints usually make me think in a different way than I would maybe naturally think. I find they make the process a little more enjoyable. And the final output is usually something I'm more proud of. So that they're actually saying that constraints promote creativity. And I think if you think of poetry, for one example, you'll find that a lot of poetic forms um, have very, very tight constraints. Think of a sonnet or a limerick or a haiku. Um, there are very, very tight constraints um, that actually promote creativity. Um, Bowden finds that at the heart of creativity lie constraints. And she introduces the idea of constraints defining a space within which creativity can take place. I love that idea of a creative space. So you're bounded by the limits and inside you have the space to create. And Chik Sent Mihai, who I've learnt has just recently died, um, a great, great writer, um, also conceptualizes a creative space, talking of creativity taking place within a domain bounded by rules which define what is possible or permitted inside the boundaries. So if you think of a limerick, for example, um, it has two long lines which rhyme, two short lines which rhyme with each other, and a final long line which rhymes with the first two lines. 
So it's, um, it, that is absolutely defines what's possible, permitted. You can't write a limerick without following those rules. So I'd like to take this idea of creativity and constraints and find how constraints can actually promote some kind of creative thinking or um, thinking within the box, but finding what is possible and perhaps hasn't been thought of inside the box before. So I'd like to start by introducing a situation um, that's as different as possible from online teaching. Um, Charlie, my husband and I um, worked on an aid project for two years in Madagascar. And the aid project was um, setting up resource centers for teachers to provide books and also training um, a group of, in, in, in each regional resource center was to be staffed by a group of uh, in-service teacher trainers. And our job was also to train the trainers um, to help them give the teachers ideas on how to use the books. So when it came to, when we came to Madagascar, we observed a lot of classes to begin with. And I have to say, I did not see a single school with any books at all. Um, sometimes the children would have exercise books and a biro or a pencil. Quite often they had slates um, and chalk. Uh, the classroom would typically have a sort of cracked square of blackboard and chalk for the teacher to write with. Obviously no photocopiers, nothing. So the big question was, um, how, did you, how could you go beyond chalk and talk um, as a means of uh, methods of teaching English? How could you actually encourage classroom interaction? And by the way, the classes were very large, probably 50, 80 in a class um, in, in the kind of rows that you see here. How on earth could you get interaction and uh, the kids to actually talk English to each other? Um, so the, the solution came from a very unlikely place, the marketplace. Um, so when we went shopping in the market for our fruit and vegetables, um, the stallholders had piles of very cheap, kind of very rough quality paper in very large sheets. And um, if you bought fruit or veg, um, with a kind of gesture I've never been able to replicate, but they would make a cone out of the paper put the fruit and vegetables in and then wrap the cone up. And that was how you got your fruit and vegetables. So these sheets of paper were obviously very cheap, um, very cheap wrapping paper that the stall holders used. And we got the schools to supply um, these large sheets um, for teachers uh, to use um, specifically for um, uh, interactive activities. So, Obviously, um, you can't give in a class that large with no photocopying, you can't give the children roll cards or information gap cards um, each. But what you could do is to make large posters. Um, this is an example of a spot the difference um, activity involving parts of the body. So what we would do was get the teachers to put one um, poster at one end of the room and the other poster at the other end of the room. And the kids would work in pairs, one facing the front and one facing the back. And then just as if they had a roll card in front of them or a, an information gap card, they would describe their picture to their partner. So um, one would say, the man in my picture has small ears. And the other would say, in my picture, he has big ears, etc., and go on like that. So that was one way of um, finding a way around um, the constraints. And uh, it actually promoted creativity by getting you to think, well, how can I get around this constraint? Um, what can I do uh, within the constraints uh, to, to um, do something that hasn't been done before? So combining a creative approach with um, uh, working within tightly defined boundaries or constraints. Oh, one other constraint was there's obviously no blue tap. So how do you fix um, the pictures, one at each end of the classroom? We actually got the teachers to put up permanent washing lines, one at each end of their classroom. And um, then they uh, pinned up the, uh, the pictures, the information gap or the roll card pictures or whatever they were using, um, using pegs, just like you peg out a line of washing. Okay. Um, so in the pandemic, we have the opposite 
of this situation. We've been looking at classrooms with no technology and the constraints that those afford. If we now look at um, the opposite situation, we have technology without classrooms. So here are some aspects of um, constraints that a platform like Zoom that we're using now um, imposes on teaching and the questions that we can try and solve um, about how to get round or how to operate creatively within that constraint. So one aspect you can use um, with Zoom is the one we're using now, which is video and audio. And this lends itself to whole class teaching, um, as I'm doing with you now. And there's a temptation to use it for explanation or to lecture. So the question is, how can we introduce some student participation and familiar ELT activities within those constraints? Um, releasing one constraint or um, adding another tool. The next one we have is participation tools. These are things like chat, but also there are buttons where you can do a thumbs up, thumbs up or thumbs down sign or type in yes or no. So students can react, but speaking is not possible. So the question is, how can we introduce more student reaction without speaking? Are games now possible? without speaking. So the next feature of platforms like Zoom is a shared screen. Um, the constraint is that only the teacher shares the screen. So the question that this poses is, how can this lead to student participation? Um, breakout rooms. The teacher can't keep a handle on all the rooms at the same time. You're always wondering when you go into a breakout room, will they be on task? What will they have been doing? Will somebody have um, used it as an opportunity to just leave the course. Um, and mingle, mingling games is still not possible, though pair and group work are more possible with breakout rooms. Um, the question is, how could we adapt this to a mingling activity? Um, and finally, uh, there's a section that we've called Zooming Out. Zoom is very tiring. Um, uh, my daughter, who's a primary teacher, often says, I feel completely Zoomed out today. Um, so how can we vary this or how can we actually exploit the fact um, that uh, everybody's connected through Zoom, but they're all in different situations, they're all in their own houses. How could we actually use that constraint that they're not together in a face-to-face -face classroom? How could we, within that constraint, how could we vary this, um, have a break from Zoom and also exploit the student environment? So I look first at the first category using, um, sorry, I'll say the, the whole talk is divided into these categories. So I'll go through these um, five categories one by one and suggest some um, practical activities that you could do um, using the various tools. So first of all, using video and audio, which is possibly um, the most uh, constrained form of the platform. So, Here's one way you could introduce a class to each other if it's your first class um, with that group. And at the end of this session, I'll do another activity which you can use to have closure, um, to close a course at the end of the course. Um, so here's the first pop activity that you could do. Um, so when everyone's come online, ask them all to turn on their video and audio. Ask them each in turn to say their name and to tell the class one thing about themselves. Begin by introducing yourself in the same way to, to, to model the procedure, then nominate a student and continue. Um, ask everyone to turn off their cameras, ask for a volunteer to turn on their camera, this is after everybody's introduced them. Ask, ask other students to greet that student and remember the fact that they said. So for example, I might introduce myself by saying, um, I'm Jill and I love cats. Um, then I would nominate somebody else um, who would then continue the chain. I'm Pedro and I like um, Ayala. Um, and they would go on like that. You can either um, form the chain by getting each student to nominate a student, another student further down the line. So Pedro would then say, um, would, would nominate the next person. Or you give each student a number. That's probably the easiest one. So Jill 
the teacher is number one, Pedro is number two, Maria is number three, and so on. So when everybody's introduced themselves and told everyone a fact about themselves, um, one at a time they turn on the camera and the other students greet the student and have to remember the fact that they told um, the class about themselves. So here's um, an example called interview an object. Um, and this actually uses the fact, I mean, you, you can bring objects into, into the classroom, but um, it's also got a bit more interaction in it. Um, uh, and we're going to do this by using the chat button. Um, so find an interesting object in your house that you put in front of the webcam. Um, I'm actually going to ban the two Kiwis from doing this because you know exactly what it is, um, but you can read other people's replies. So you show the object on the camera. Can you all see this? Have I got it in front of yes, the camera? Yes, it's, it's okay, thank you. So um, the stu you, the students, are going to interview the object and you will answer questions as if you were the object. I will answer the questions, in fact, as if I was the object. So don't say, is it a, say, are you a, or do you come from? So the object is as a person. So ask the students to think of questions to ask the object in an interview. So give them some examples. Um, for example, are you made of wood? Um, and some time to prepare. Put the students on mute and one at a time nominate a student to ask their questions. Unmute that student so they can use audio and respond to the questions as if you were the object. Now I can't do it with you all with video and audio, but I'm going to do it with the chat. So um, I'm going to stop talking for a bit and ask you to type in your questions to the object, to the object, sorry. Do you come from the land of the long white cloud? Yes, I do. And I will answer. Yes, I come from the land of the long white cloud, Aotearoa, also known as New Zealand. Any more questions? Type your questions into the chat box and I'll answer them. Are you happy there? Yes, I'm very happy there. Um, are you made of wood? Yes, I am. Are you a traditional form of art? Yes, I am. What type of wood? Not sure. A New Zealand wood, it could be Rimu. Are you a tool? No, I'm not a tool. Do you represent something in nature? Yes, I do. Are you heavy? Yes, yes, I'm very heavy. Um, actually, it depends what you mean. The, the wooden um, art form is heavy, but the actual, um, what it represents in nature, what I represent in nature is not heavy. So I am heavy, but what I represent is not heavy. Any more questions? Anyone want to make a guess? What am I? Okay. Are you animal, vegetable or mineral? Well, I'm made of wood, but what I represent is vegetable and I don't represent the wind and I do represent a kind of tree, a very special tree found in New Zealand. Okay, I'll stop the chat and I'll give you the answer. Um, this is a New Zealand symbol. It's called the koru, and it's a Maori symbol, and it represents the, uh, the new leaf at the beginning. Um, is your name koru? Yes, it is. Well done, Adam. Um, it's a koru. Uh, it's the new growth on a tree fern. Um, you see it at the end, uh, at end of a leaf, and it gradually unfurls and becomes the leaf that you can see behind it there. And it's a Maori symbol, meaning new beginnings, new life. 
And this was actually given to us. Um, we, some time ago now, we became New Zealand citizens. We have dual nationality. And at our citizenship party, this was given to us by some friends, um, some, uh, some parents of a friend of Laura's um, from school who were actually Maori. And um, it symbolized um, the beginning of our new life in New Zealand and our new kind of life as, uh, as Kiwi citizens. So um, that's the story of this object. Um, okay, going on now. Um, okay, so what question that um, that we posed in kind of getting around constraints was how could, how could you use activities that are very familiar in the classroom that you could use quite often um, in, in the classroom? Uh, how could you use them given the constraints of only video and audio with Zoom? So here's one called running dictation. Um, if you know that uh, in the face-to-face -face classroom, um, you get students, you put students in groups and they take turns um, running from their group to the board, memorizing a bit of a dictation, coming back and dictating it to the group, then the next person goes and so on. So here's how you could actually do a running dictation using Zoom. So email a paragraph of text to one student who either prints it out or opens it on their phone. Tell the student to put their phone or paper on the other side of their room. And the student will have to give a running dictation to the rest of the class within a period of time that you specify. To do this, they have to run across the room to the phone or paper, memorize a group of words, and then run back to their computer to dictate the phrase to the rest of the class. You start a timer and tell the student to start the activity. You can also um, involve more students um, by having short paragraphs. And when one student finishes the short paragraph, you choose another student um, uh, to do the next paragraph. So there's actually, um, the nice thing about this is there's um, a bit of um, uh, action involved. Instead of just sitting in front of a screen, you're actually um, uh, getting somebody up and moving and um, going around the room. Okay, so we've talked about video and audio. In this next section, we're going to go forward uh, one step in releasing constraints and look at some tools that um, enable participation. So these tools are like the chat box that we've been using here or um, the thumbs up, thumbs down sign. Um, so you can use them to do things like um, polls or get the students um, interacting with the chat. So here's one called the longest sentence and it uses the chat box. So you type one word, e.g. the or a in the chat box and tell the students that they're all going to work together to try and make a very long sentence. So nominate a student and as I said before, one of the best ways of doing this is giving students numbers in advance. So for example, Abdul knows he's number one, um, Marisha knows she's number two, and they have to type in order. So student one, Abdul, types your word, the, followed by another, e.g. the cat. So student three then nominates, uh, sorry, student three then types the third word in the sentence, the cat sat. Student four, perhaps you'd like to do this, type in the chat type into the chat box to everyone um, what you think student four might type after the cat sat. Okay. Silently, bye, that's nice. The cat sat silently near, the cat sat on the, yeah. Okay, you've got the idea, except the way you'd be doing it, you're all typing in at once, but the way you would do it with a class is by having a strict um, order number. Um, uh, and one of the best ways is to give the students numbers in advance um, so they know what number they are and where they come in the typing of the sentence. Here's another um, one using participation tools, and this is using the thumbs up or thumbs down buttons. Um, so tell the students you're going to send one of them the name of a famous person. 
So private message one student with the name of the famous person. You can either use the private function on the chat button or you can um, text them on the phone. And that student turns off their camera. Students have to guess the identity of the famous person by asking yes, no questions. For example, they could ask, are you living now? Are you a film actor? And the student with the name of the person can only reply using the thumbs up for yes or the thumbs down button for no. When a student thinks they've guessed, they can say, suggest a name. Are you, etc. Okay, we come on to releasing a constraint again. Um, I'm going to look at something we can do with the shared screen button. And here again, I'll ask you to um, participate using the chat. So sharing your screen um, are activities where the teacher can share the screen. But as I think I said in the introduction, um, it's only the teacher who can share the screen. Um, so how can you make it communicative? So here's a little activity where you can use a shared screen um, as a basis for a communicative activity. This is an activity called Art Thoughts. So create a collage of eight to 10. Actually, there don't need to be that many, maybe four to five. Um, the one I'm going to show you has four um, of people and number them. They must be of people. Display the collage of artworks on the shared screen. The students each choose one artwork and imagine the thoughts of the people in it. They should post their ideas in the chat box without mentioning which artwork they're referring to. Students read each other's ideas and guess the artwork by posting the number. So here's our collage of artworks and we're going to number them in order. Is the man with the pipe and the hat is number one. The two harlequins are number two. The lady in the red hat is number three. And the lady in the red suit and the black hat is number four. So I'd like you to choose one of the pictures and think, what is that person thinking? What's going through their head while they're sitting there? And type what you think they're thinking into the chat. If you read somebody else's contribution, um, so say somebody has typed, when on earth will he arrive? And you think it's picture number three, type the name of the person who posted it. For example, Ella, I think it's number three. Okay, so two tasks. One is to type in what you imagine the people are thinking or one of the people is thinking. And two, to read other people's contributions and reply to them saying which picture you think they've chosen. Okay, off you go. Um, okay, Sakito, no, you can't see the number of each picture, but I described the numbers. Um, the man with the black hat and the pipe is number one. The two harlequins sitting together is number two. The woman with the tall red hat is picture three. And the woman with the black hat is picture four. Okay. Typical Jerry, always late. So start typing your thoughts in now. <laughs> Tetsuya, I think that's picture two. What's the world going to? The date is boring. Okay, I think David Chapman is number four. Anyone else got something to type or something to guess? <laughs> my hair is hurting my neck. That's an interesting one. I think that's... Maybe number one. Mm. 
<laughs> Great. Oh, lovely. These are lovely. <laughs> Great. Great. That's that's great. Okay, I'll um, close that off. Uh, feel free to continue typing if you want. Um, here's a little activity called sharing your screen. Um, same words, different place. So um, you can get students to work in pairs um, in a breakout room sorry, um, get, get students to work in pairs and, um, sorry, and uh, improvise the dialogue. So the first one takes place in a supermarket. A says, excuse me, do you have a minute? Yes, yeah, sure, how can I help you? Thanks, I'm looking for the dairy aisle. Sorry, I don't understand what, the dairy section. Meat, um, sorry, butter, cheese, I need some milk. Ah, oh, yes, I know, it's aisle 15. Um, it's about three aisles on if you go that way. So they practice this um, in different ways, and then they have to transport the dialogue to a different context, i.e. looking for directions in, um, in a town. So, excuse me, have you got a minute? Yes, how can I help you? I'm looking for the hungry horse. Sorry, what? Oh, the hungry horse, it's a pub. Um, I think it's next to the museum. Oh yes, I know, um, it's in Museum Street. Uh, go straight on, turn left, and take the second on the right. Okay, um, so another way we can remove constraints is using breakout rooms. And this obviously um, gives you the possibility for students to work in pairs and groups um, instead of all being together um, in uh, using the video and audio and shared screen. It, does have its disadvantages um, in that you don't know quite what's happening in all the different breakout rooms. It's not like having people working in groups or pairs in a class where you can actually see what they're doing. Um, my daughter, who's a primary school teacher um, and has been teaching online for the last three months, teaching a group of nine, a class of nine-year-olds, 26 nine-year-olds on Zoom every day for the last three months. She texted me, oh, the joys of primary teaching. She said, you visit a breakout room to see if they're doing the maths task that you set them, and nobody's doing the task at all. Instead, they've all put on doggy faces and are going woof, woof, woof. So um, that's a, a very primary challenge. Um, but these activities are mainly for um, older students. So here's one activity you can do in groups um, in a breakout room. And this is called Dream Towns. Um, so the explain the task to the students. They'll work in groups. Their task is to design a town that they would all like to live in. Um, explain that some things might be important, uh, more important to some people than others. So for example, for a couple of people, having a good gym or leisure center might be very important. For other people, having a range of cinemas, theaters, um, et cetera, might be important. Um, for a third person, having lots of green spaces. For a fourth person, having living by the sea or living in the mountains might be important. So take a poll to begin with, just to introduce the activity with a thumbs up button by asking questions. So for example, how many people think having a gym is important? How many people think having living in a town by the sea is important? Then you put the students in groups and three to four in breakout rooms they discuss their dream town and they produce a map showing how their town would look. The town must include all the things that each student thinks is important. So if one student thinks the gym is important, it must have a gym. If another student thinks lots of cafes are important, it must have lots of cafes. Then they prepare a short presentation about their town that they'll give to the class. So each student in the group takes a turn to describe a different aspect of the town. Um, they prepare the presentation with a drawing and then you bring everyone back to the main room and each group presents their dream town, showing their map and explaining the different features. So breakout rooms um, can be used to create um, 
small group discussions and pair work. And they can also be used in this way to create an information gap. So everybody in the class is explaining something um, different to the class. Um, here's an activity called clock batch. It's very simple. Um, you get students to, sorry, I'll put the thing up so you can see it. Tell the students they need 10 small pieces of paper about the size of a playing card or a bit smaller, okay? Um, so they need 10 of these. Dictate 10 times to the whole class, for example, quarter past 10, half past six. Um, and for each time, the students draw a clock face showing the correct time, each on a separate piece of paper. Make sure all the students have the correct times on their clocks. Explain that students are going to play a matching game in pairs in breakout rooms. So you put them in pairs um, in separate breakout rooms. Each student lays their card face down so they can't see the face. It's a bit like Pelmanism, you know, a variation on Pelmanism. And they take turns in asking others the questions and selecting cards to answer. So imagine there are two groups of students, a pair of, sorry, a pair of students, um, and they have their cards and they've got them face down so they can't see them. And the first student picks up one and says, it's half past six. The other student selects the face down card and says, it's a quarter past 10. A quarter past 10 and half past six don't match. So they have to put them back down, face down carefully, but try and remember where they put them. Then it's student two's turn to kick off. And student two picks up a card and says, it's half past six. Okay. His partner or her partner can remember now where they put the six or 30 card down and says, it's half past six. Their times match, so they can throw both of them away or put them aside. Um, they have to repeat and go through till all the times have been matched up and they've got rid of all the cards. Um, the final section um, in this talk I called zooming out. Um, it's, Zoom can be extremely tiring. You're sitting in front of the screen the whole time. So it's nice to get the students away from the screen and do things that get them looking, perhaps looking outside, sitting in the garden or on a balcony if they don't have a garden or just looking out of a window at the street. You can also use zooming out to take advantage of the fact that you've, because every student's in a different house, you've got a built-in kind of information gap situation where they can show each other different things in the house. For example, um, a piece of clothing that they used to wear a lot but don't wear anymore, or a childhood toy they were very fond of and speak about it. Um, so you've got this, the, the advantage that they're um, in different places and you can exploit that um, for information gap and um, uh, pair and group work. But you can also try and get them off screen and looking outside. So here's an activity to that gets them out into nature to have a break from the screen time. So a sensory poem. You ask the students to go outside to sit in silence and think of the following questions. And if your students don't have a garden or a balcony, um, perhaps just look out of the window and they think about what can you see? What can you hear? What can you smell? And what can you feel? When they come back, they discuss what they experienced. Then on the shared screen, you give them a framework to write a poem. So hearing, um, you give them noun plus ing, for example, birds singing. Sight is again noun plus ing. So for example, a cat sleeping. Smell, the scent of plus noun. So for example, the scent of roses and then touch, noun, preposition, noun, the wind in my hair. And you get them to use that framework to build a poem. So for example, summer afternoon could be birds chirping, butterflies fluttering, the scent of flowers, the sun on my face. Autumn morning could be wind blowing, leaves falling, the scent of bonfire smoke, a chill in the air. 
So a very simple way of writing a poem, but quite an effective one, and getting um, your students off the screen and into nature or the outside. And it could either be, you know, um, they don't have to live in the country, it could just be a city street. You still get birds and butterflies in a city street. You still get leaves falling and the wind blowing. Okay, so in this um, talk, we've looked at um, the relationship of creativity with constraints. And we consider, first of all, classrooms without technology and how you can operate creatively within those constraints. And then it's opposite technology without classrooms. And we considered how you could operate within constraints, um, find creative activities within the given constraints for video and audio, shared screen, participation tools, breakout rooms, and getting away from the screen. Um, the book um, that these activities were taken from was published a few months ago um, by Pavilion. And um, we've got about five minutes for questions, if you have any. Perhaps you'd like to type them in the chat. Jackie, should they type them in the chat? Um, it's up to you. If you'd like to do it uh, verbally, they can turn on microphones or whatever is easiest for you. Yeah. I'll do either. I'll do chat or microphones, whichever you feel like doing. Okay, right, right. So yes, so you can type in the chat or just turn on your microphone and, and speak. That's, that's fine as well, please. So we've got about five minutes and then I'll do a final closing activity. Oh, Sachiko uh, yes. has raised her hand. Go ahead, please, please. Hi, um, I was just wondering if there were any um, problems with doing these, the, the activities sound great, but I was wondering if, if there were any problems such as kids falling down and when they were running, falling down and crashing into things, or is there anything <laughs> we should tell them, bef tell yeah. them beforehand? Yeah, um, we've actually in the book, we've put cautions uh, with everything um, that involves uh, students going outside, you know, saying, uh, make sure only do this if the area you live in is safe and if your child is over X, Y, Z. Having said that, um, I think we had not a primary school audience in mind when we were writing. It was more a sort of um, young adult, um, adult audience. Um, so, oh, okay. um, and, and were they excited about it? Like, so I would were, were the young adults excited about this? Like, were they not shy and it's like, oh, it's kind of... No, I think we, I mean, we've tried out quite a few activities and I think people, people enjoyed them. Um, quite oh, that's a great. Yeah. Okay. I right. think the morning, I mean, running dictation is quite a normal activity in, in classrooms. Um, presumably if the children were younger, the, the parent would be around and the teacher could, could oh. say to the parent, um, make sure your child has a safe space to run in. I see, I see. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, go ahead, Adam. Yep. Okay, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Lots of wonderful activities, I loved it. Uh, the question that I have actually relates to getting the students actually started with the activities. Uh, do you find that some activities are easier, you know, some activities have the students taking to like a duck to water and other ones more like a duck to molasses? <laughs> um, and how do you scaffold them into, say, the more complex activities? Um, mm, good question. I, th I think it's the same in the classroom, really. So, some activities go kind of... Uh, you know, some activities go really well, some kind of turn the students off, depending on the, the nature of the students you've got. Um, but what I think we were aiming to do with the book is um, get away from, I mean, Zoom was originally designed for sort of meetings and it's a sort of business format and the format has been designed around people talking and giving screen, you know, um, shared screen presentations. And it's working within the constraints to try and get the students interacting a bit more. So my feeling is, I suppose what the book came from was that what would turn the students off is being talked at all the time um, by the teacher with, with a screen. And so the question was, how can you get away from chalk and talk and that actually involve the students? 
I don't know if that answers the question. I think it depends so much on the type of task. Are there, are there some, some activities that you'd say, you know, if you do this activity before this activity, both will go well, but if you do it in the opposite order, they don't? Do you find something like that? Or? Um, the book's not in any particular order. It's a kind of dip in and fish out teacher's resource book format. It's kind of mm. flick through and find a... I mean, it's not a course book, I think is what I'm saying. So you don't have to do it in any, any particular order. Well, um, uh, great advertisement for the book because I'm definitely going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just hope it's useful for teachers that are, you know, we've all been thrust into this situation of um, suddenly having, having to teach online instead of face-to-face -face and uh, trying to find creative ways around doing it. And, um, Yeah. I, oh, I, thank you very much. Yeah, I love that way of thinking. It's 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 perfect. I think so. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, there. Uh, next. Uh, you know, Yuki. Um, as uh, sent. Uh, it's it's just come directly to me. So I'll just read it out, and then Hiro Yuki, if you want to add something, uh, please please feel free. He says, uh, "How can I?" Is the key phrase in my head. I think. Who is going to teach is more important than how we are going to teach. <laughs> I envy your students. I wish you had been my teacher when I was a student. Thanks a lot. Awesome presentation. Great, great comment. Yes, I think who you're teaching is is important, but um, and I think that meshes in with how you teach because they 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 interact and they one depends on the other and it's it's a, a dynamic relationship. I think. Yes. And Tim's put a uh, comment in the chat as well. I don't know if you've seen that as well. Um, oh, yeah. Now we have to find time to look at it. Yes. In, in, a, in a busy, busy teacher's life, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to get uh, time to do everything. OK, I'll, um, as I think the questions have stopped, I'll just do a closing activity, which is um, I began with an activity to get everyone to introduce themselves to each other. And here's an activity for closure. Um, for the end of a course. Um, it's called Irish Blessings, Gaelic Blessings. So here are some um, traditional Irish blessings. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm on your face. May nothing but happiness come through your door. May you be surrounded by goldfinches. I think that's possibly my favorite. May the roof above us never fall in. And may the friends below it never fall out. So what I'd like you to do is to type into the chat a blessing um, for the other people that have been sharing this webinar um, for going forward. It could be a message for their teaching, for online teaching, for teaching in general, um, for life in general. Um, anything you want, um, beginning May and end uh, the webinar with a blessing. Maybe live in interesting times sometimes. Yes. Oh, I agree. May 2022 be a bit closer to normal life. May your classes go well. May you inspire students to try things they, can, they cannot do. I did this once. Um, as a PD activity um, at the beginning of um, at the beginning of a, a university year with my colleagues, and um, it was a face-to-face -face activity. So I got them to write their blessings on pieces of paper. I put them all in a hat, and everybody took one out um, as they left the room. The one I got said, "May your board markers always be moist."
May you find inspiration instead of frustration and constraints. That's lovely, yeah. Nothing worse than a dry bone market, yes. <laughs> Great. These are lovely, um, lovely wishes to take away with you um, for the weekend and the working week to come. May the sun shine inside you always. How lovely. Okay, everyone. So as I said, it's a nice positive way to end a course and um, to get students to give um, to give blessings and give good wishes to everyone that they can take away with them. And yes, I hope goldfinches visit often. Um, in fact, one of the reasons we moved into this house in New Zealand was when we first looked at it, there's a tree outside um, with a very sort of prickly fruit. Um, and when we first came, first looked at the house, it was full of goldfinches eating the fruit. Okay. Well, it's been lovely sharing this with you and I really enjoyed it and as I said my my hope is that activities will be useful um, for you in online teaching and thanks very much for coming. Thank you very very much Jill this has been amazing really lovely and lots of things I think for online and for in the classroom as well. Um, I love the poem one. Even even if we're all in the classroom, you can do that. A lot of the other ones as well. But yeah, thank you very, very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Thanks for sharing.